This is the Boys Podcast from TV Podcast Industries. We're back with the Boys for Season 3, Episode 1, Payback. I'm, I'm not going to take the bet, but, uh, wow, really? Mm-hmm. Okay, still, Butcher delivers every time. And I have to apologize for him every time. Look, Butcher's the guy you want in a shooting war. No question. But we're in peacetime. Back, fellow boys and girls. We're back on the Boys Podcast for season three of the Boys on TV Podcast Industries. We're talking about season three, episode one, Payback. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow boys and girls. It is great to be back mm-hmm. on the Boys Podcast. And yes, I am one of your other hosts, John. We're going to do this slightly different in this season. Uh, I have mentioned on some of our other podcasts, uh, we're not going to have John and Chris on every single podcast for this episode, but it is just myself and John for this one. Uh, Chris will be back later on in the season uh, as we go through, and we are recording a little bit in advance uh, for The Boys Season 3, and my mind is blown once again. (laughs) Uh, I just love it. I love all the irreverence, the shock. Uh Um, I mean... One scene uh, that we will come to mm-hmm. later on. Uh, I thought it was one body part. It turned out to be another part is. of the body. Um, <laughs> and probably more shocking. Um, so, yeah. yes. The end result, though, was a lot of blood and a lot of gore. Uh, but, yes, the irreverence here uh, is just very, very good. Yeah. Uh, and back straight in the wheelhouse of the boys absolutely yeah. i just think i forgot i think it's been yeah. a while we we did cover the boys diabolical the animated series earlier on this year if you haven't listened to those podcasts you can get them on our main feed on tv podcast industries or on our boy boys podcast feed i'd suggest you check them out if you didn't get the chance to check the animated shows out there are some connections that are coming into this season and there's some uh, some of the style i guess uh, of the show is on display in the in the diabolical animated series but uh, it's just been a while since i've seen the live action i went back and watched a bit of season two as well just to kind of refresh my memory there were some big shocking moments that i did remember from season two (laughs) but some of the more minor shocking moments are close to what we see in this episode but we won't go into that right now we'll go into it uh, in our spoiler filled discussion about the episode if you haven't joined us in a while make sure that you subscribe to the podcast at tv podcast industry you get access to all of our episodes over there and we'd love to hear your feedback as i mentioned we are recording these episodes in advance uh, of the release of the show so we want to hear your thoughts as you see the episodes how shocking did you think it was email us to feedback at tv podcast industries.com or pop on over to our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries and you can pop uh, any of your thoughts in the spoiler posts over there for the boys yes so let us get cracking Mm -hmm. into episode one of a new season of the boys (laughs) shocking blood splatteringly Uh good uh derek what are some of the episode details? Well, the people that you have to thank for that are showrunner Eric Kripke, who's the writer and uh, writes the screenplays for a lot of the episodes. Um, he is joined on the executive producer roster by Seth Green and Evan Goldberg, who brought us uh, Invincible, the cartoon, uh, brought us many, many uh, shows and movies as well in the yeah. past and did of course bring us uh, the previous couple of seasons of the boys as well uh, this episode was written by craig rosenberg uh, he's an executive producer on the show and wrote wrote episodes four and seven of season one and episodes three and seven of season two wow so yeah in good hands here and mm-hmm. he has been bumped up to a season opener absolutely what a job he did as well yeah <laughs> uh, the episode was directed by phil scragia uh, he's directed 45 episodes of eric kripke's other major show the supernatural so a uh, long time collaborator of eric kripke as well uh, this is his third episode of the boys after directing episode three of season one and season two premiere uh, he's also directing next week's episode or next episode episode two uh, of season three as well Yes, excellent stuff. Yeah, so the the boys are back together, let's say. How he got the camera in uh, that orifice, mm. I'll never know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. The making of documentary or uh, or <laughs> the x-ray on uh, on uh, Amazon Prime might tell us that. <laughs> but John, do you want to tell us what they gave us with the synopsis for this premiere episode of season three of The Boys? Sure. 
It's been a quiet year since Homelander was subdued after his girlfriend Stormfront was revealed as a Nazi and burned up by Billy Butcher's superpowered stepson Ryan. But Stormfront is still gripping to life and other things as Homelander's frustration with events is growing, as he is continuously forced to tell the world he's just a normal man who fell for the wrong woman. When he takes his frustration out on former fastest soup alive, A-Train, Queen Maeve has reached the end of her patience. She brings in Billy Butcher to find the body of Soldier Boy, the long-thought dead leader of the former soup group Payback. If they can find the cause of his death, maybe they can find the weapon that can finally kill Homelander. Maeve also has another weapon for Billy, Compound V24, a 24-hour boost of soup powers that might level the playing field. Billy Butcher is also working through his frustrations. With the death of his wife, Brett Becker, Billy now works for the Federal Bureau of Superhuman Affairs. It has been using the boys to take down rule-breaking soups, including the diminutive Coke Fiend Termite. But created by government representative Victoria Newman and Huey Campbell, it just doesn't have the same level of violence towards soups that his old life had. Plus Huey is now Billy Butcher's boss to add salt to the wounds. When Termite rips his boyfriend apart from the inside out, the boys think they have him. But Newman has made a deal with Vought Industries to keep the soup on the street in exchange for some lower level thugs. As Huey begins to suspect his partner Newman, he stumbles across an encounter between her and a childhood friend that ends with Huey's new wonderful life at the Bureau and with Starlight exploding in a pile of guts and blood. Excellent. I thought Huey might get out uh, of the episode without <laughs> being covered in blood and guts, but uh, but it was unlikely, really, uh, to start with. That's kind of the uh, kind of the way they have it uh, with Huey Campbell, uh, always covered in blood and guts. Yes, I have to say, some of the reaction shots that Jack Quaid gives are the reason why he's getting so much work at the moment in TV <laughs> yeah. and movies. He is so, has such a great face for for the type of things that are going on in The Boys. It's fantastic. Um, that's where we're going to start. We're going to start with our boys, our protagonist moments for the episode. Uh, I'll choose one. John, you can choose another one of the, uh, of the boys moments. Um, these don't always fit the episodes, but I think to begin with, we're kind of separate on separate paths of The Seven, The Boys, and any other outstanding moments that we have. So uh, let's kick it off first. Uh, do you want to go first or will I go? First. Yeah, I go first. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. It is Huey. Right. Um it's, you know, his new wonderful life. I mm. mean, this is a year on. He has kind of he's got Starlight there in a fairly settled relationship. Mm -hmm. He is working for the Federal Bureau of Superhuman Affairs. Yeah. It's like the boys, except more bureaucratic and yeah. kind of cleaner, really. This, He's this, not being yeah. splattered with tons of blood like he was in previous seasons. Exactly. Like when A-Train went uh, straight through his girlfriend, mm -hmm. the opener of season one. Yep. So it, it, it's really good to see. But you see through this episode that what's happened in season two has been great for Huey. And it contrasts with the likes of Billy Butcher, mm -hmm. uh, as well as Homelander. But you see the little sort of cracks that begin to appear in this whole um, new life, this mm -hmm. new wonderful life, uh, this new wonderful so-called life that Huey <laughs> thinks he now has. Yeah. And it's primarily around um, his job in the, the Bureau. Mm. It's He really likes Victoria Newman. Yeah. He gets on with her. They have banter over lunch. Absolutely. She wants to share his bagel. It all seems quite rosy. Yet there are moments here uh, where something just sort of pops its head above that perfect uh, world. And that is a man called Tony mm -hmm. who is recognizing Victoria Newman. It was firstly at um, a star-studded event for the the launch of the new Vought Studios or Vought Plus um, 
Dawn of the Seven. Uh, it's really taking from Disney and <laughs> Marvel Studios here, really, Absolutely. really well. And don't forget, also a, a commentary on the on the Snyder Cut as well, because they say it could have been just dumped on the streaming channel, but because of the hashtag of save the uh, save this uh, director's cut, the Burke cut, uh, they were able to get it out in the cinemas. Uh, this eight hour cut, I think they call it of the movie yeah, as well. So, exactly. uh, so yeah, lots of fun being had. And I, I do love they even changed the Vault Studios logo to look exactly like the Marvel Studios logo. Yes, same font, uh, same coloring. Uh, nice, nice little, uh, I, I guess. They're getting into the into the realm of parody even more this season because they're yeah. specifically picking up on things that we're seeing very often in superhero shows and movies. Definitely, and yeah. there's a really nice moment with Ashley and the director of of this. Oh yes, or. or so-called director of this eight-hour blockbuster Dawn of the Seven mm-hmm. because um, they're having effectively quite aggressive sex in, in the toilet cubicle. Yep. And, you know, there's a lot of mouthing going on. Ashley wants him to the director to hold on to her hair mm-hmm. and, and to pull it. But ultimately, she's screaming at him, Tony Gilroy <laughs> had to do all your reshoots. And he's, like, shouting... I know I'm a fraud, I'm a fraud. <laughs> it was just really, really funny. Hilarious. And the other interesting thing about Dawn of the Seven movie that's on display here is mm-hmm. Stormfront is played by Charlie Theron. Yes. Uh, who, and again, she is dressed in purple with all the purple clothing, mm-hmm. which is very, very close to her role right at the end of Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness mm-hmm. as uh, Clay. One of your uh, favorite comic book characters. One of my characters. favorite comic book characters. Yeah. And Clay is very important to Doctor Strange, who is also her motif is purple as well. So I thought whether that was by accident or design, I don't know. But Stormfront was in purple, that dark purple suit yeah. in season two. So it's not necessarily by design in terms of mm-hmm. the purple motif, but whether uh, Charlie Theron being that that in that role who knows but anyway it's just really nice send-up of um the the movie the comic book movies and um i guess marvel studios ultimately which we cover a lot of on uh the defenders podcast so it was nice it was kind of just good fun to see that it was it just it just felt really weird being that close to multiverse of madness having shows thrown in both the roles because exactly they really do the lead up to it they don't show her on screen for ages and then uh, and then she just turns to the camera revealing that it is Shirley Theron. I thought that was uh, that was really good and then suddenly you're going hang on a second we just saw this in the cinema two weeks ago Basically. as the big reveal in the post credits yeah, scene exactly. so. <laughs> uh, but bringing it back to Tony yes Tony at, at the red carpet event of this but also he comes to the bureau offices mm-hmm. is calling Victoria Newman Nadia oh, yes. um, and is looking to speak to her face to face and chat to her so and he's quite insistent coming to the bureau as well yeah. and and Huey notices this uh, in amongst the red carpet event yes. and then sees him at the bureau the other interesting thing about the red carpet event is as Huey sees him there is this great little moment again harking back to season 1 and everything in between where a train meets him on the red carpet they've got He's got his arm around him. They're smiling for all the paparazzi there. Mm -hmm. And Adrian just turns to him and says, who'd have thought we'd be doing this after everything that's gone on between us? Uh, Referencing him killing his girlfriend right at the opening of season one. And they did have lots of battles in season two as well. Yes, exactly. So, yeah, not, not friends, but suddenly they're on the same side because of everything that's going on here with the connection with him and Starlight and, of course, with the Bureau. So uh, I, I also love the paparazzi telling Huey to get out of the way so they can photograph Starlight on her own. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. you know, it's like, yeah, I know she's got a boyfriend, but get over there so we can take photographs of her. <laughs> but so Huey really has, you know, he's suddenly got his ears radaring around, mm-hmm. really trying to find out and get some kind of answer as to who this man is, why is he speaking to Victoria Newman as Nadia? And following the bureau, he's still Tony is still hanging outside mm. the the office, f- waiting for Nadia. And ultimately, he spots this, and you get the wonderful year of blood free living, um, or blood splatter free all over the face and clothes, and um, that 
Huey normally gets uh, involved with when mm-hmm. he's with Billy Butcher and, and the rest of the boys. And he's uh, overhearing a conversation between Tony and Nadia where they talk about the Red River Project and the Red River Institute where they they grew up together. Yes. And that her name there was Nadia. But ultimately, Nadia, in a comforting hug to Tony, then that's her moment where she has her opaque eyes come to um, to effectively blow his head off. She, yeah. We know that she's the exploder of people's heads from the end of uh, season two. Yeah. But the interesting thing here as well, it seems very, very directional. And yeah. there is, like, she, he knows what's about to happen, his... His nose starts to bleed. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's part of his power. Not entirely sure, but he knows that. So tries to close her eyes and, and hide them mm-hmm. and, and stay away from their their direction, effectively, yeah. from their line of sight. And he, in doing so, she manages to get one of the eyes open where it just takes out his hand, explodes his hand mm-hmm. off. And to be honest, it's the... The death of him, she manages to get a headshot. It doesn't take his head up mm-hmm. fully off, but it takes his jaw off and he's effectively bleeding out. And then she looks at him and explodes the entire body, of yeah. which time Huey is covered in uh, body bits and blood. Yeah. But the other side of this betrayal that Huey sees, this... This undermining of his ideals, uh, of what he thought he had, at le- you know, with his job, is she's immediately on to Vought Industries for a cleanup exactly. crew. Yeah. and uh, Just like all the rest of them. Yes, yeah. so just like all the rest of them, and that's where um, this episode finishes. So it was a yeah. really good um, ending for this episode. Nice and bloody, as we expect from the boys. Of course. Uh, but also a little bit of a shift with uh, Victoria's powers um, in that it seems to be more directional. And if you can somehow stop her eyes from opening up and going opaque, mm-hmm. she can't actually utilize her power. Yeah, blindfolds at the ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, um, yeah, I, I did. I really like that kind of addition to it. As you say, with last season, all we'd seen were these heads exploding and then it revealed right at the end that Victoria Newman was the one that was doing it. Now having this twist on it that she's not even Victoria Newman, she's somebody else that we'll learn about uh, as the season goes on yeah. and that this power is really different. Uh, at one point, just the uh, red... Uh, River Institute. Uh, we did see that back in uh, the Diabolical Animated Series, the Red R- River Institute is where the orphan kids are. Um, so I wonder if the two are connected for yeah, uh, maybe. for the series. Maybe so, it's another orphanage. Mm, yeah. Or is the whole project, the Red River Project, all across the country has all exactly. these, uh, these orphan kids in there. So uh, that'll be interesting to see. In the animated episode, we saw how awful the powers of the kids that were stuck in this in- institute were. So uh, interesting to see that we have someone like Victoria Newman who has this really powerful power um, and, and is out now uh, in the streets so uh so that yeah that was a real a real shocking moment particularly for huey as well uh, anything else about huey from uh, from the episode i think the only other thing with huey is just he's having to manage um billy butcher really you know he mm-hmm. is effectively giving billy commands he's dictating to him what he can and yeah. cannot do yeah um in terms of when uh, they look to go after uh, the the soup termite, mm-hmm. but it, it's basically, you know, he's sort of jostling that, and and you can get the sense that Billy doesn't quite like this. There has been a role reversal here. Yes, Billy has a soft spot for Huey, but he's also the butt of many of his jokes Absolutely. and pranks, and um, his, his sharp tongue. So, you know, that's the, the other side with Huey, it, but. Huey doesn't mind this because he has this great job at the Bureau, or so he thought until the end of this episode. And he's also quite settled with Starlight. um, And they're not having to hide their relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really fun uh, addition to the show. Uh, one other thing for me to mention about Huey for the episode, we we also get a special guest appearance we from do. Simon Pegg returning as, uh, as Huey's dad. Um, character in the comic book based on Simon Pegg so uh, so it's interesting to see him uh, back on here. I'm always surprised when he's doing an American accent though 
I keep expecting Simon Pegg to be doing a <laughs> yeah, Scottish I accent know. or an English accent when he's uh, when he's talking there to Huey. Uh, so surprised again to see him uh, see him back there. Uh, very cool though. Um, I'll take the other major. Uh, boys protagonist moment it is about billy i almost thought you were straying in to tell uh to talk about no, billy no. there um, but uh, but no the other big side of it is billy now being the kind of the fist of the bureau um himself and the boys are being sent out uh to take down these soups and this is much much closer to the billy butcher and the boys of the comic books this is very much their modus operandi they go out and take out individual soups uh that are that are causing trouble i suppose uh and they go full force at them. You see these quite brutal scenes in the comic books. And this translates quite well to this season's version of the boys, I think. Um, last time it was much more going for after the seven. Uh, this season seems to be, uh, at least this first episode is about going after uh, Termite uh, as their mission. Yeah, but it's to go after them to bring them in. So the, with the Bureau now here, it's that he feels like he's been neutered almost absolutely absolutely you can see why because yeah. in, in the situation we have here with termite um not going to go in and explain it in full detail uh, you, you all saw what happened um, but effectively while uh, termite is doing some coke uh, with his boyfriend um you get a, a sense that something bad is going to happen the first time he sneezes after having uh, after having some cocaine uh well yes yeah. this was just like wow uh-huh. this was okay the boys have gone there. I mean, we thought plowing a speedboat into a whale last season mm. um, and and them if, all emerging from the carcass of the whale was pretty shocking. I think if we go all the way back to Popclaw in season one when the guy's going yeah. down on her and, uh, yeah, he uh, loses his head. He um, certainly does. You know, there's and de- definitely precedence in the past for this, but even the setup of the scene where there's a party going on in Termite's house and he's having sex with a doll in a doll's house while everybody's watching around him, you know this guy is up to no good. Yeah. Uh, much more in this season, I'm seeing the idea that we saw, we heard from Stan Edgar last season, and we heard from other major players in the bot industries that the soups are are super powered people, but they're not superheroes. And the minute they put together that, Stan Edgar says it in this episode, the minute they put together that idea that once you have superpowers, you're a superhero, that allowed all of these people to go out and abuse everything around them from drugs to sex to drink everything because they think they can get away to with violence it. as well uh, exactly. to violence absolutely i think i think the great thing though about this setup with termite was simply that as he comes after he's been in the dollhouse pretending to have sex with the uh, one of the mm-hmm. barbie dolls he he brings his boyfriend in his boyfriend says i want you inside me and you you know that just normal sex. Yeah. And he miniatures down. And this was the point where I thought, okay, when when I saw the hole, I thought it was the rear uh, end. And instead, yeah. it was the front end. And, of course, giving sexual pleasure from the inside here, uh, literally, huh. uh, with whole body. But, yes, he has done way too much cocaine. And his nose is kind of... You know, it's that sort of... (gasps) He sneezes and effectively rips open Uh his partner's body from the inside, from the groin, and... Well, I said I wasn't going to describe it. I'll describe it, I didn't make any uh, any claims about what John was going to do. Which was both shocking... Well, the whole thing was shocking. As I say, um, you you wouldn't want to go in there with hay fever either. If it was hay fever season, he would be... be Tread well if he's not already treading a difficult path um, or passage, then he would be treading a difficult path there if he had hay fever. It would certainly be the same outcome. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, but these are the things that will turn people off or just make people love the boys. Exactly. It's so outrageous, so outlandish, so sort of literally in your face absolutely and and as it continues the, the resolution as i say the reason why billy feels like he's being neutered is what happens to the team that are sent in frenchy and and Kamiko are sent in to take out termite yeah. to capture termite and then we get 
effectively the battle with Ant-Man is what we're seeing yeah. here. This Ant-Man <laughs> fight, the, the Vos version of Ant-Man fight, where he basically sh- shrinks down to a place where he can't even be seen and yeah. starts to fight on uh, Frenchie, starts to go up his leg and get inside of him, uh, f- trying to do the same thing, <laughs> pretty much, is what, what seems to seems to be going on. Um, Absolutely. Sorry, I was just, I'm laughing because I just think, well, you wouldn't see that in a Marvel Studios you, you picture. Would not. You really wouldn't. You would not. But there is a comment uh, on that, which was, uh, remember uh, the internet meme that was going around about how Ant-Man could have killed uh, Thanos? Yes. That's effectively what Termite was trying to exactly. do to Frenchie. Yeah. Um, but I love how it resolves with Billy Butcher. Uh, effectively getting Termite into a bag full of coke. I love how Newman describes it later on as a metric Belushi of coke. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yes, unfortunately, John Belushi uh, died after taking a massive yes. overdose of uh, of drugs. So exactly. it's now called a metric Belushi of coke. Like, uh, uh, yeah. But yeah, it was just what a way to kind of open things off mm-hmm. after the the whole dawn of the seven epicness and the red carpet. It ends off with... Yeah, quite early on in the episode, this whole thing with termites yeah. uh, playing out. So, uh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But to kind of go back into your point about, about the relationship between Newman and, and, uh, and Huey within the, the episode, this, uh, it should also be a little bit of a reveal as well, because once again, even though they've uh, gotten all the details, even though they've uh, tracked down termite the way the boys would have done in the past, they're not allowed to capture him. He's being released because Vought has an advertising contract for him, so they're going to just throw some other soups under the bus. Yeah, some lower-level, third-tier kind of soups. And yeah. then, as always, with bureaucracy, it does come down to percentages. Uh, Newman explaining that they're now 60% down on collateral soup damage uh, on the previous year. So it's all good. You don't have to worry about Termite. He's going off for his advertising contract, and we can get some more soups off the street. And it's all working well, isn't it? Um yeah, the, the, we should we should have known that uh, that Newman had some major connection with Vought, shouldn't we? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. whether whether they're just blackmailing her or um, as we see, she makes the phone call and they do the they to tell them to come in and do the clean up. Yeah. Uh, at the end, um, so whether whether they're blackmailing her or something, maybe that's maybe that's what the connection is between the two. But um, but I'm sure we'll see that in the next episode. Uh, but this is all set up for Billy Butcher and his. Um, I suppose his state of mind uh, within the episode. Um, we see Maeve giving him the uh, this new compound, this compound uh, V24, they're calling it. Yeah. Um, this 24 hours of being a soup. We had, we had that conversation between Stan Edgar, the new presidential uh, candidate, the wonderful Bob Singer from uh, from uh, Supernatural coming back, uh, which I thought was really cool. And this all builds up to Billy's state of mind at the end of the episode. You know, I think at the end of the last season, we were wondering whether Billy would even come back to the boys. Would he come back to work? Would he take this offer and go and work yeah. for the CIA? Or would he go and work for this this bureau? And this season, here he is starting out working for them. But obviously, he's worked there for a while. Huey as his boss probably doesn't go down too well. And we get the standoff really at the end of the episode between himself and Homelander with Homelander saying to him, you know what? We're being sidelined here. It's used to be the CIA. Now it's the Bureau and Vought and they're sidelining both of us treating like treating us like the old guard. Will we make a pact that we will go all out, take everybody out of the way <laughs> until only one of us is standing? That's what you want, isn't it? And you can see from Billy, his reaction to that is, Absolutely, that's exactly what I want. Just me and you. Yeah. At the end, and only one of us can live. So uh, I love this. This is our new place uh, for Billy Butcher. Even after everything that happened to him last season and losing his wife, he's still on the warpath against against the soups. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's just really good because at some point I kind of thought Billy was hallucinating or was dreaming this whole sequence. Mm-hmm. But it's the two of them... Her, Homelander and Billy Butcher mm-hmm. share this deep frustration of how their behavior is being controlled yeah. by others that they really don't think are as good as them for different reasons, you know, or, or don't value or respect their opinions in a sense. For, for Billy Butcher, it's Victoria Newman's diktat and the Bureau. Um, he's been doing this for ages, and then you come along and tell me how I should control suits. Yeah. Um, with Homelander, it's that he is the most powerful superhero. He is the captain of yeah. the Seven, 
And yet now he is with the fallout from Stormfront and everything. He is being told that he must go on and say, I'm just human. Uh, I may have all these powers, but I'm just human. So it's this mutual frustration. And this scene was just so good. I mean, again, it's to Anthony Starr and and Carl Urban Mm -hmm. and, and how they just chew the scene so well in terms of the tension it provides to the scene um and you know because ultimately homelander is there to try and find out where his son ryan is and billy is like saying i'm not going to tell you that you know um it's at six seven three Nosh Nosh Mybolikov. So Billy Butcher, you know, is standing up to him, and this is the moment of truth where Homelander realizes that they are like God and the devil in his mind. They're mm. the opposite, but they have this sort of grudging respect, and they will always be facing off against one another another uh, and it's like you say you know it, he i think he says you know we're from the same tradition you know that this yeah. this idea that um there are people who are just better it's from a superhero point of view with with homelander mm. with billy butcher it's that you know he is a tactical military genius and he's now being told what to do by effectively what he would think of as pen pushers well in, exactly in the bureau yeah so this was a great scene. Uh, I really, really liked it. It was, but I did have to watch it three times to work out whether it was real or not. I really yeah. felt there was <laughs> something about it that felt like they weren't really? having this conversation yeah. was going on in in, uh, in Billy's mind or something exactly. like that. So, uh, so an interesting position to start out of the season. And I'm not too sure whether the intent was Homelander saying to Billy, it'll be the two of us at the end. It sounds like... You go for your your scorched earth concept. I'll go for mine, and one of us will be left standing. Only one of us can destroy the entire planet, basically. Yeah, and exactly. one of us will do it. Is the is the idea of it? But uh, that's my point on uh, on Billy Butcher. We get onto an antagonist moment. Your favorite antagonist moment, or the seven moment from the episode, John. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I it was Queen Maeve actually mm-hmm. uh, coming out as an informer to Billy Butcher. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily think to the bureau, but yep. to Billy Butcher directly. Mm-hmm. The 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 incident on the aeroplane from the last season mm-hmm. is still haunting her. It's still with her that all those people were allowed to die, yeah. and that you know it finally got to her you know to the point where she sides with the boys to bring down homelander to Mm -hmm. neuter him and stormfront Uh, and this is this is the situation that she's now in she but she's still part of the seven you see the relationship between homelander and queen maeve is very tense i they're not speaking to one another effectively on the red carpet Mm -hmm. at dawn of the seven Homelander just walks away and Queen Maeve is left smiling uh, on her own. Yeah. So there's no love loss now between these two. And we have this moment where she sees Homelander um, criticizing A-Train for now wearing a girdle <laughs> and for putting on a few pounds, even mm-hmm. though it doesn't really look that fat, but it's just it, it's enough for, for Homelander to be giving out to him. Um, and well, the point is, A Train has lost his power, lost his ability to run, or is no longer running. Yeah, exactly. And it's being covered up by everybody around them. Yes, he's going out and eating the same quantities of food he would have had to have exactly. uh, when he was able to so, expend that energy. So, so he's yeah. starting to put on uh, on his, on weight, mm. at least in Homelander's mind. And and A Train just gives out to him silently, you know, sort of to himself as they part and Homelander does the whole laser eye, red eye threat Mm. to A-Train that he will take him if he doesn't sort himself out and get back to um, I guess to his normal trim Uh, and he has another moment like this with the deep as well yeah kind of, I think it's more with Homelander that a-Train no longer belongs on the team, but he's being kept there and this issue is being covered up. Yeah. He's no longer a superhero in Homelander's mind. He's just a face that used to be on the team before. So Homelander's not telling him, 
uh, you know, stop getting fat. He's telling him, get your superpowers back or get off the team. Well, <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah. But it, it, it's coming from that place of frustration with mm-hmm. Homelander that is being neutered, is being restricted yep. in his mind. And here's someone who he doesn't feel is as good as him, mm-hmm. who is actually even worse now because he's lost the powers. Yeah. Um, but is still there on the team. And this exchange where Homelander really does threaten A-Train. Yeah. And we have another one where it's very, very close to that with the Deep who Absolutely. gets a media slot before Homelander. So it's really tense. And again, it's Anthony Starr. You just don't know whether he's going to laser the face off the Deep or A-Train. Yeah. And he doesn't. He always pulls it back. But no matter how many times we get these... I always feel that it's the possibility that that's going to happen. It's yeah. the same with him in Billy Butcher's apartment. Mm-hmm. It's just so, so good. The Absolutely. unhingedness that, that he brings here. Absolutely. And, and Chase Crawford and, and Colby Minifee uh, both really sell that as Ashley yeah. in the deep. They really sell that tenseness of, oh, oh, if I say the wrong thing here, he could go off like an yeah. atom bomb in front of me. I love that it ends with the deep's wife going, what the hell was that confrontation there that almost got you killed effectively? That he's going, that went quite well, actually, yeah, considering know, exactly. my, my previous uh, uh, interactions with Homelander. Exactly. So, I yeah. mean, so it's just really good. But coming back to Queen Maeve, she sees this altercation mm. with A-Train. And with the memory of all the death on the flight and what went down mm-hmm. there, um, she comes to, to Billy uh, with a new lead. And this is the lead that Soldier Boy... He was known to have died in protecting the world from a power plant explosion. Yeah. That's the official line. Back in the 80s. Back in the 80s that he died. But there is rumor that it was um, through a secret Russian weapon that was... She has a file from Mm -hmm. from the Vought records. And she passes this to... To Billy Butcher, um, effectively saying this is a way to kill Homelander, to even the playing field. Yeah. Whatever was used against Soldier Boy can be used against Homelander because effectively they're of similar power level. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also at the same time, she provides Billy with three vials of a, a green compound, a new Vought compound, uh-huh. which is V24. The whole thing that that Derek has mentioned, that it gives 24 hours. Mm. And we do have this lovely scene as well between um, Stanley Edgar. And he's there just s- sat with Representative Bob Singer, who's going for president now, mm-hmm. uh, to try and see about selling V24 once they've ironed out the imperfections with it. So the important thing here on this V24 that's been given to um, to Billy Butcher by Queen Maeve is it's not as such the final product. They're still testing. Mm-hmm. There could be issues with it. And um, so I really kind of liked how this ties in with, you know, providing V24, which could protect Billy against Homelander before they find Soldier Boy. Yeah. And the corporateness of Stanley Edgar trying to effectively squeeze out as much cash from the U.S. Army by going to who, what was Congressman um Bob Singer, and who's now running for president. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, what, what did he end up uh, calculating it out as 600 million, million 200 yeah. million a month? Yeah, uh, if that operation for lasts a unit. Month. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, he's definitely working out. He is my antagonist uh, for this episode, actually, Stan Edgar, because uh, his moments throughout this episode. I know I, I, I always come into this thinking I'm going to talk about Homelander in the antagonist moments, but Me we too. end up talking about Homelander across all the rest of the points and how much he's involved in the episode. So I think we've kind of talked about most of what happens in this episode with Homelander. Yeah. But Stan Edgar's what, what's, what he's doing within this, this concept that he has and talks to Bob Singer about is – he basically wants to get into pharmaceuticals, and right now he's in the soup babysitting game. He has to deal with so many issues of these people that have superpowers, and unfortunately, they told the world they were superheroes and led the world to believe that they're gods and them to believe that they're some kind of gods getting away with everything. So most of Stan Edgar's time is really spent cleaning up after them, 
covering up for them. And if he could just get rid of them and move on to dealing in the drug now, this this V24, which won't turn people into superheroes, it will just give them some powers for 24 hours, yeah. then he's cle- free and clear uh, to deal with what he's doing. I love how he undermines Homelander in this episode as well, because yeah. there's another the other big moment of Stan Edgar, the other big antagonist moment is he's now put Starlight on a collision course with Homelander by yeah. making her co-captain of the seven. Uh, there, there's that great moment where he brings the two of them in for a meeting. Homelander basically tells Starlight to, uh, to get lost because he has a special meeting with Stan Edgar and then realizes the meeting is actually for both of them uh, to determine who's going to be the, the new co-captain. Um, and then he sends Homelander off packing as well. So to add insult to inj- injury, the numbers don't lie. Everything that's happened since Homelander got involved with a Nazi has started to erode the reputation of Vought, and he's going to pay for it. Is effectively the way the way Stan Edgar. Yeah, uh, e- e- at exactly. It. And what was really good here as well is just as, you know, a- as Homelander leaves, mm-hmm. Stanley Edgar closes kind of the blast doors from the Death Star yes. over, but continues to talk. And Starlight's a little bit shocked by this uh-huh. because she's saying. He can hear through those because yeah. he's been quite detrimental about Homelander. Absolutely. And, and saying to Starlight, this is your opportunity. Think about it. Mm-hmm. This is power. Not being able to exactly. sort of do a force push. This is power. Mm-hmm. Being able to control the behaviors of people. Yeah. And he, you know, he's right. He is a non-superhero CEO of a corporate multinational. Exactly. And... He has no superpowers, but can, but is controlling the most powerful man on the planet in Homelander. So I, I loved that whole scene. Absolutely, um, but I did feel worried for Stan Edgar. He did, definitely he did say Homelander could be listening outside, and his actual comment is, he's in, he's effectively in control while I lead this corporation. You go, don't say something like that. That means you may not be uh, alive for much longer if, if he thinks you're in control of him. Uh, that's my antagonist moment for the episode. Any other points and notes, any other outstanding moments from the episode for you? Well, Stormfront is alive. Um, that Absolutely. I wasn't expecting. That was a shock. Um, that was a real shock. I mean, she is basically, uh, one arm is down to the elbow. Mm-hmm. Both her legs are off at the knees. She's lost an eye. She's incredibly burnt. I mean, I absolutely thought that she was dead. She was ash at the end mm-hmm. of season two, but mm. she is there on life support. And It's she interesting, is- isn't it? Because we did say in our final episode last season that it's a possibility she'll come exactly. back because we didn't see her die. Exactly. Like, she is so close to Anakin Skywalker that I thought she was going to be in the Darth Vader suit this yeah. season. <laughs> and she's still talking about Homelander leading the, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed race, you know, being their leader. Uh-huh. Uh, Homelander is, doesn't really um, want to get, get into that. As far as he's concerned, he has a different vision of this super race. And that super race is, yes, he has blonde hair and blue eyes, yeah. but the super race is that he's a soup. Um, he is the strongest of them all. Mm-hmm. Um, he doesn't have to worry about... The ideology exactly. of Nazism is like she said at the, you know, before she got melted down Stormfront to what we see in this episode. Mm-hmm. People like everything I say. They just don't like the word Nazi, you know, <laughs> putting it with that <laughs> oh, jacket yes. on. Um, so, evil, evil woman. But Homelander is kind of ambivalent a bit almost towards that. But he understands that he is a super race. But it's just simply because he's strong. He can fire lasers out of his eyes. He can fly. He's bulletproof. Yeah. Immense strength. But all he's of that unique, kind of stuff. though. And they seem to be lining up behind him. She's effectively yeah. saying, we are going to become the master race. And he's kind of looking at her going, you're not even on my level. Um, I am <laughs> I am the leader of the planet that I should be. Is kind of the way it, it's coming across. So uh, but, really interested to see her back there. Yeah. But even as she's looking pretty rough in the hospital bed, Homelander is still trying to extract sexual pleasure of from course. her. And uh, again, that's another uh, sort of you know, fantastic boys moment. Again, completely outrageous. Uh-huh. Um, 
but who knows what goes on uh, in hospital beds. Wow. Only the matron, I guess. Oh, gosh. Uh, right. I just think it's just one of those boys moments. Uh, it is. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to pull out a couple of nice moments from the episode, things that I really liked seeing uh, in the episode. Kamiko, um, who hasn't spoken for uh, for the two seasons, yeah. having her her moment singing Dream a Little Dream of Me, I thought was absolutely lovely uh, that she has this kind of, uh, this moment where uh, music is going to get her past her ability to speak. Uh, and I was, I was taken aback. I was trying to remember, did she speak in the last season? That Was there a moment that she, that she had a big conversation like, like, uh, Silent Bob from Jane Silent Bob is was is she just quiet? Not that she can't speak. So yeah. uh, so it was great to see her uh, having this lovely musical number in there. Also, um, MM yes. Mar- Marvin is back home with his uh, with his wife and uh, and daughter, and then we find out he's not. It turns yeah. out his wife has left him for somebody else. But um, but he's see- come out of the he's gotten out of the game. He's, he's gotten out of the game, or has he? But, well, he is surrounded by soups at a superhero uh, themed birthday for his daughter, Janine. Um, I have to say, I love his gift to her is the Flavor Flav clock. Your first Flavor Flav clock. <laughs> yeah. As she's dressed as Starlight. As, as she's well. dressed as Starlight. Exactly. Uh, but I, I do like this with And of, uh, and of course, the new, uh, the new boyfriend for, um, for his wife is dressed up as Homelander as well. Yeah. That must be rankling him a little bit, even I- though he pretends... Exactly. And he says to his wife, it's fine. I've been out every year. I've but, gone anywhere but we near see it. when he gets back home and he opens the closet door mm-hmm. that he is actually is investigating payback, the, the former number one soup team up and in particular, yep. um, soldier boy, mm-hmm. but he has all these newspaper cuttings. So he's out of the game in the sense of he's not involved with the boys. He's not with Billy Butcher yep. or. Kamiko mm-hmm. or Frenchie, yeah. but he's still got his own grudge and um, that is buried deep. He's at inside. least at least continue to uh, to do his investigations. Yeah, as exactly. Well in the past. But yeah, uh, really nice to see Mother's Milk back. I'm sure we'll see more of him uh, as the season goes on. Any last points about the episode, John? Yeah, it just relates back to the plane foot as well. I loved that scene after Billy Butcher had been given the V24 by Queen Maeve, where he's back at his apartment. It, it's quite close to when Homelander comes to his mm-hmm. apartment but the plane footage is is being played um and he's watching that as the kettle is whistling and screaming higher and higher and higher mm-hmm. just like billy butcher inside i just it's, you know it's just one of those nice little uh motifs that happen in terms about the pressure that's building it, it also lends to the frustration that Billy Butcher is going through with Absolutely. his current situation and what's happening. So that was just a nice little shot. And yeah. um, I do think the pitch got really quite high. I thought my eardrums were going to burst <laughs> at one stage, but <laughs> was. it was really nice little scene. Yeah. Nicely done. Yeah. Really, really good, uh, really good moment for them as well. That's it. That's our points and notes for our first episode of the boys. Welcome back to the world of the boys. Uh, we missed you. Um, we forgot about you. I feel like I went throughout the whole of season one and season two, actually mostly season two, when we learned that Huey was a, a Billy Joel fan, complimenting the show for not playing my least favorite uh, Billy Joel fa- song, <laughs> uh, Uptown Girl, and it's played twice in this episode. So I don't know whether it was just uh, they wanted to use it or they didn't have the money to pay for the rights, but I really just like the song at hearing it twice, um, even though I like Billy Billy Joel, uh, I must say. But uh, I hate the song. <laughs> so maybe connecting it with this type of uh, blood gore and violence uh, will make me like it more in the future. Okay, musical Stormfront. <laughs> That's me. That's me. With that, John, how would you rate this episode as the, as the opener for season three? Yeah, I absolutely really enjoyed um, this episode. It really mm-hmm. plunged me back full frontal uh, into the world of the boys. <laughs> Literally. I give it four and a half fatal sex sneezes out of five. <laughs> um, it was ju- it was shocking. It was bloody. Uh-huh. But, you know, at the heart of it, it talked about two men um, as fish out of water mm-hmm. in a situation that they don't particularly like. They don't play by the rules of wider society like SOPs uh-huh. uh, or... Um, just simple courtesy yeah. and I, I just really like that and how it sort of contrasted with Huey who loves that stuff and mm-hmm. um, you know could get ISO 9001 in the blink of an eye because he <laughs> just loves that 
administration. You know, wow. there's that moment where he sits down at the desk all happy with himself mm-hmm. after having the wonderful wake up moment, you know, on the phone to his dad with Starlight, who thinks he's cute. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's his world. And then that starts to get undermined with the further revelation, a nice little nod to the diabolical short animations with the Red River mm. uh, Institute, Red River Project. Uh, and we see that Victoria Newman, not only has she been exploding the heads of cultist leaders and, and other congressmen, but in calling Vought Industries, you know, that mm-hmm. she has some connection, she is embedded in some way with with Vought. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. Uh, yeah, really good episode. Loved this great opener to it. Uh, I've missed the boys. Um, it's it's such a contrast to all the other shows yeah. that we cover. And they know it because um, I think every single interview I've seen with all the cast are going, I know we said it last season that we were going to go wild, uh, but you haven't seen anything yet. <laughs> and this opener is uh, definitely showing that. But once again, a well-written episode and, and a good concept and a good storyline to kick us off for the season as well. Yeah, it's not absolutely. It's not just all about the shocks. That's what makes up the clips for the YouTube video at the end of the season. It is also about the characters and their interactions with each other. It's I really, really enjoy that about the show. Exactly. Yeah. Good stuff. With that, we are off to the pub, fellow boys and girls mm-hmm. and quizzes, because we have the boys pub quiz. Pull up your pork scratchings, get <laughs> some scampy fries, and of course, remember to have a warm pint of toenails as well, also known as bitter, right. um, with you as we go to the Billy Butcher pub. I'll just go for a cold lager, thanks. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Let's get the first question of our season of the boys pub quiz questions. Uh, when you get these questions, it's going to be one for each episode of the show. Uh, gather them together, send them into us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com and you'll be in with a chance of getting your hands on some boys goodies. Question one, John. Where yes, are we? Yes, question one. What gift does Billy Butcher bring Homelander's son, Ryan? Ooh, very good. Very good. Give it one more time. What gift does Billy Butcher bring Homelander's son, Ryan? Excellent. That's the first question. Seven more to go. Get them all into us by the end of the season uh, at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. Thank you so much for joining us this episode. Uh, This episode of TV Podcast Industries was brought to you by all of our supporters over on Patreon, including Heather Wallace. Thank you so much, Heather. Yeah, thank you, Heather, for the support over on Patreon. Really uh, good of you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for your support all the way along, Heather. Great to great to hear from you and great to have uh, your support over yeah. on Patreon. If you want to support us, you can support us monthly for any amount over on Patreon at patreon.com slash Industries. Or if you'd like to support us with a one-off amount, you can also pop over to buymeacoffee.com slash TVPI and buy us a coffee uh, to help us out with all of our editing processes. Yes, and remember, you can also support us by subscribing to the podcast over on your favorite boy or girl podcast catcher Mm -hmm. of your choice. Share the podcast, subscribe, rate us, leave a review, uh, but importantly, share it with friends, family, and whoever else yeah, you would like to, because sharing the love is, of course, sharing the podcast. Mm-hmm, absolutely. We've got loads and loads going on in the podcast, particularly during June. Uh, we'll, we will be covering the rest of the boys. Uh, next up is The Boys Season 2, Episode 2, The Only Man in the Sky. And we will also have our podcast about Episode 3, Barbary Coast Out, uh, later on this weekend. Uh, we are also covering Miss Marvel on Disney Plus and The Umbrella Academy Season 3 over on Netflix. So uh, lots and lots of things to talk about. Uh, please. Please join us. Please stay subscribed to tvpodcastindustries.com and please send in your feedback. Email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with your thoughts about anything that's going on in any of the shows that we're covering. Yes, you can also head on over to our Facebook group at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash TV Podcast Industries where you can leave your thoughts, theories, ideas, shock and awe at it, <laughs> shock and horror at uh, yep. the boys. And... Um, over on our Facebook group where we put up a spoiler post 
uh, for each episode. Absolutely. Don't don't spoil things for anybody who hasn't seen the episodes. Go into the spoiler posts. Uh, lots and lots more to talk about. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you again soon. Yes, thank you so much, fellow boys and girls, for joining us. As always, it's been great to dive back into the boys' <laughs> show, uh, as always, and to get out of our comfort zone, I mm-hmm. guess. And remember, keep watching, keep listening, and like any good battle between good and evil, keep fighting. Bye. Bye. Bye.